الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام الرسول اللہ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و تسیم و بحبل اللہ جمی و اللہ تفرق رب شہلی صدری و یسلی عمری و حل العقد تمل ثانی یف کہ کولی مائی رسپیکٹ ریلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈیئر برد اینڈ سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود دا اسلامک گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگز آف اللہ سبحان و تعالی آف آل مائی ٹی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو کین یو انکریز دا افیکٹ لٹل بٹ اینڈ دا بیس میگر بٹ لو اینڈ دا ہائیس انکریز لٹل بٹ مو اینڈ دا بیس افیکٹ لٹل بٹ مو دا ٹاپک آف دس ایوننگ اسٹاک از یونٹی ان دا مسلم اما لٹل لیس دا ٹاپک از یونٹی ان دا مسلم اما دس از این امپورٹنٹ اے یونیک اینڈ اے ویری سینسیٹو ٹاک امپورٹنٹ بیکاز نن آف دا مسلم ول ڈس اگری دیٹ دیر از نو یونٹی ان دا مسلم اما سو اٹس اے ویری امپورٹنٹ ٹاپک It is a unique topic because <clears throat> as most of you may be aware that most of my talks are targeted towards dawa targeted towards the non-muslims as well as the muslims together and i usually give two types of talks one type which is related to comparative religion for example similarities between hinduism and islam similarities between islam and christianity muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in hindu scriptures muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the world various world scriptures is jesus god was jesus christ peace be upon him crucified and various talks these talks though they are targeted or meant for the non muslims giving them knowledge about islam and the comparative religion it even benefits the muslims to a great extent to do dawa amongst the non muslim friends so it's for both though the topic is on comparative religion it's meant for both for the non muslim giving knowledge about islam and for the muslims giving knowledge about comparative religion how to do dawa the other group of talks that i give is mainly on issues which are current which the media attacks islam for example women's rights in islam or people think today's age of science and technology islam is outdated so quran and modern science these talks of second groups it caters to both the muslims get knowledge about the rights of the women in islam about how scientific the islamic religion at the same time the muslims are also educated about the religion about the good points about the haq of the religion there are very few talks which i have given hardly any which especially cater only to the muslims for example al quran should it be read with understanding because some of the muslims say that quran should not be read with understanding so i give that talk or dawa or destruction these talks are exclusively for the muslims even though the non muslim will benefit but it is more targeted towards the muslims so today's talk i say is unique because it is more it's mainly meant for the muslims the non muslim may also benefit but mainly meant for the muslims unity in the muslim umma and i say my talk is going to be sensitive unlike my other talks meant for the muslims only a small group of muslims believe that quran should not be read with understanding the majority believes it should be read with understanding some group of muslims say dawa should not be done majority believe it should be done but this topic unity in the muslim umma is sensitive it involves each and every one of us each and every type of muslim therefore i say it's sensitive and i request all of you that please pay careful attention to the matter of my talk 
inshallah it will be enlightening at the same time it will show you the true picture of islam inshallah therefore please pay careful attention to my talk this talk of mine unity in the muslim ummah i may not be able to cover all the aspects all the solution i'll try and cover the major ones number one reason for disunity in the muslim ummah is because of the various sects that we have as well as the various schools of thoughts among the muslim ummah you may call it madhab you may call it maslak you may call it musalla so the main reason number one the major reason is because of the various sects that are there in the muslim ummah and the various schools of thoughts the madhabs or the maslaks or the musallas we call it inshallah at least i'll try and cover this major point and if time permits some other points also and quite a large portion of my talk will be in the form of question and answer which is usually asked in our day to day life so that whatever questions i pose each individual can ask that same question to himself and give the reply to himself so that you may come to know where does each individual stand and as most of you know the master key for dawa of islam according to me in the quran the verse of the quran is surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 64 which says kul ya ahlal kitab say o people of the book talo ila qalmatin sawa in bainana bainakum come to common terms as with us and you which is the first term allah na wada illallah that we worship none but allah wala nushrika bihi shay'a that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'd guna ba'd dan arbaban min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than allah but if they turn back fakulu shadu say e be witness be anna muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i have mentioned in several of my talks that this verse of the quran which says come to common terms as with us and you though it mentions ahl kitab specifically referring to the jews and christian it can refer to any type of non muslim whether he be hindu or a buddhist or a jain come to common terms as with us and you and if we take it a step further according to me it can even apply to the muslim ummah that when we have differences in the muslim ummah the best thing to do is tala ila kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as with us and you so this part of the verse according to me can also be used for the muslim ummah and it is the best way for doing islah for correcting the muslim for getting them to the straight path normally when you ask any muslim which is the most authentic and best book of islam which is the best source of knowledge in islam can anyone guess quran mashallah you don't get any award for that simple question simple answer no one will disagree he may not be a practicing muslim but if you ask any muslim which is the best book in islam the most authentic book the best source for knowledge in islam the answer is quran mashallah but nothing great the second question which is the next source of knowledge after the quran hadith mashallah no two difference hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you may say sunnah you may say hadith there is no two difference everyone agrees whichever type of muslim he may be he agrees the first main source is quran the next is hadith now most of us are aware that there are different types of hadith some hadith which are sahih hadith which are strong authentic some hadith are zaif hadith which are weak hadith some of them are maudu concocted fabricated hadith 
which hadith a Muslim should follow? Sahih hadith. MashaAllah. Three questions, the answer remains the same. It will not differ. Any type of Muslim you ask, whichever group you may belong to, whichever sect you may belong to, the answer is the same. Number one source is Quran, Allah's Kalam, Allah's Word. Number two source is the saying of the Prophet, the hadith, the narration of the Prophet. Number three, that in the hadith, what we have to follow is the Sahih hadith. No two view at all. Come to common terms as in Asin you. Now, based on these three answers, we proceed further. But when I ask a Muslim that what is he or what school of thought he belongs to or what is his mother, most of the Indians. They tell me they are Hanafi. Some may say they are Shafi. If I go outside India and when I ask this question, besides Hanafi and Shafi, I may get the reply, I'm a Hanbali. Or some may say I'm a Malaki. But in India, majority of the Muslims, they call themselves Hanafi. Some even call themselves Shafi. There are others, but these two are the major groups. I ask the next question. Brother, why are you a Hanafi? Why are you not a Shafi? So the common reply I get is because my parents were Hanafi. My father was Hanafi, my mother was Hanafi. So I am a Hanafi. So then I ask him a question. What if your father was a Shafi? So he tells me, Brother Zakir, if my father was a Shafi, even I would have been a Shafi. Answer is simple. I said, very good. Till here it is simple. What if your parents were non-Muslims? What would you be? Then there is a long pause. See, you told me if your parents, because your parents are Hanafi, you are a Hanafi. If your parents were Shafi, you would have been a Shafi. Very logical. What if your parents were non-Muslims? Then there is a long pause. I said, brother, why didn't you reply? He replies in a very soft tone, maybe I would have been a non-Muslim. Softly he says, maybe I would have been a non-Muslim. So I said, fine. Now if your age is 30 or 40 years, and now if you give me the reply that you are a non-Muslim, whether a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew or a Jain, you give me the reply, I am a non-Muslim because my father is a non-Muslim or my mother is a non-Muslim. Will you be excused? There's a long pause. He doesn't reply. I said, if you say yes, then all the non-Muslims today, even they will be excused. Because most of the parents have been non-Muslims. So there's a long pause. Then he gives me the reply after thinking. If Allah gives me Hidayah, I will become a Muslim. I said, fine. If Allah gives you the Hidayah, you will become Muslim. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 69, that if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do jihad fi sabulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open his pathways for you. The criteria is you should strive. If you strive, Allah will give you hidayah. It's a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up his pathways for you. So the criteria is that if you strive, Allah will open up the pathways. Like yesterday we saw and in the few past. So the criteria is that if you strive, Allah will open up the pathways. Like yesterday we saw and in the few past few days. We saw many non-Muslims coming and telling that, you know, I've been born in a non-Muslim family. What's my fault? And I told him, and many of you were there yesterday, and I proved to him that, fine, if you accept Islam now, all your past sins will be forgiven. So yet, you have a chance, and many non-Muslims have accepted Islam. So the criteria is that you should strive. So when you tell the non-Muslims that they should strive in order to find the haqq, if a non-Muslim comes and tells you that why are you a Muslim, and you give the reply because my fathers a Muslim so he will tell you have you strived have you tried and found the truth 
so it becomes a duty even to study about Islam read the Quran and the Hadith compulsory if you tell the non-Muslims we shouldn't include that to the Muslims even you should strive for the Haqq then I say Alhamdulillah your parents mashallah they have Hanifah Shafi belonging to Muslims and my parents are Muslim Alhamdulillah therefore we are Muslims Allah's grace Alhamdulillah then I ask him the next question that brother you said you are a Hanafi which is better Hanafi is better a Shafi is better that's the next question which is better Hanafi or Shafi most of these group of Muslims they will give the reply all the four schools of thought are on the truth that's a common reply that all the four schools of thought Hanafi Malaki Shafi humbly all of these four, four schools of thought they are barhat they are correct some will say Hanafi is right some will say Shafi is right but the majority will say Charo Musalle Barhaqe, all the four schools of thought are correct. Then I ask another simple question. Now, these questions are known to everyone, it's not a difficult question. Then I ask the next question Brother, in your Musalla, in your Maslak, in your Madhab, in the Hanafi Musalla, if a man is in Vudu and if accidentally he touches the woman or a woman touches him does he go outside the state of wudu or is he yet in the state of wudu in urdu we say wudu tutti hai kya does the wudu break or not in english we will say is he yet in the state of wudu or outside the state of wudu so the hanafi will reply that in the hanafi madhab the wudu does not break i said fine let's go to the next question in the Shafi Madhab, in the Shafi Musalla, if a man accidentally touches a woman, or a woman accidentally touches a man who is in a state of wudu, is he yet in the state of wudu or outside the state of wudu? Uski wudu tutti hai kare. Does his wudu break or not? The reply will be, MashaAllah. All of you know it. Simple question, simple answer. The wudu breaks. It's nothing difficult. All these questions so far are simple. In the Shafi Musalla, the Shafi Madhab, the Wudu breaks. My next question, again very simple. I ask the question, dear brother, can both be simultaneously correct? That one Muslim's Wudu breaks when it accidentally touches a woman and the other Muslim's Wudu doesn't break when he accidentally touches a wudu, when he touches a woman accidentally, can both be simultaneously correct? I'm not asking who's correct. For who is correct, you may have to have knowledge of Quran and Hadith. My question is simple. Can both be simultaneously correct? No. Simple question, simple answer. No reward for that. If I pose you the question, one teacher teaches, two plus two is not equal to five. And the other teacher teaches 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Can both the teachers simultaneously be correct? Yes. The person who doesn't know maths may say yes. I agree with the brother. The person who doesn't know maths may say yes. All those who know basics of maths, who have passed even standard 4, will say no. Because everyone knows 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. So the first question is, if one teacher said 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5, other teacher said 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, can both be correct simultaneously? The answer is, no. Simple. I believe most of you may have passed standard 4. But if I ask you a slightly difficult question, 375 multiplied by 625 is equal to 1,525,000. One teacher says that, the other teacher says 375 multiplied by 625 is not equal to 1,525,000. Can both be correct simultaneously? No. You 
don't have to be a mathematician. Which is correct if I ask you? Who is correct? Then you may have to take a calculator and calculate. Even if you don't know maths, but if you're logical, one faith is equal to one million five hundred twenty-five. The other faith is not equal to one million five hundred twenty-five. Even if you don't have a calculator, you don't know maths. Both simultaneously cannot be correct. To know which teacher is correct, who is correct, you may have to take a calculator and press the button, and then you may give the answer. Either the first or the second is correct. Fine. Everyone is with me. Mashallah. So similarly, to say who is correct or which madhab is correct, the Hanafi or the Shafi, can both be simultaneously correct? The answer is no. But which madhab is more correct? What is the reply? The same reply. You have to check up in the authentic sources. Number one is Quran. Number two is Hadith. Correct. So now, this answer, who is correct, Hanafi or Shafi? Here, everyone will not know unless he has strived in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He has strived to find out the truth. Now, when we read the Quran, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number six. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe, when you prepare yourself for salah. Wash your face and your hands and arms up to the elbow. Rub your head with water. Wash your feet up to the ankle. That means doing wudu is compulsory before salah. And if you are in ceremonial impurity, you have to bathe. You have to have a bath. And the verse continues. Or if you are ill, if you are ill, or on a journey, or when you come back. From the call of nature, offices of nature, or if you are in contact with women, or if you touch a woman, and if you do not find water, take clean sand or earth and rub it on your face and your hands. Talking about tayammum, if there is no water, do tayammum. So, based on this verse of the Quran, which says that if the woman touches, if you touch a woman. The Arabic word is lamas, coming from the word masah. So based on this, that if the woman touches, or if you touch a woman, you have to do wudu. Of no water is there, you have to tayammu. Now, or you have to bath, bath or wudu or tayammu. Three options. If there is no water, tayammu. Now, as far as the Arabic word masa is concerned, it has got two meanings. If you look in the dictionary, what is the meaning of masa? It has two meanings. One is a physical touch; the other is a sexual touch. So, these two great imams, they were great scholars. Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahim Allah, may Allah's mercy be on him. He took the meaning that if you sexually touch a woman, then do you do having a bath becomes compulsory. The masaya mentioned is sexual touch. Therefore, physically, if you touch a woman, the wudu does not break. Imam Shafi, may Allah's mercy be on him, Rahim Allah. He took the meaning physical touch. Masaya has got two meanings. Anyone can be right. So he took the meaning physical touch. So according to the Hanafi school of thought, sexual touch breaks the wudu. Physical touch does not break a wudu. According to Shafi school of thought, even physical touch of a woman breaks the wudu. You become outside the state of wudu. Now, masa has two meaning. Each scholar took one meaning. But the best commentary of the Quran is the Quran itself. And if you don't find in the Quran, Then go to the next source. That is the hadith. But when we look up at the other verses of the Quran, <clears throat> if you read Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number forty-seven, this word of masa is even present there. It speaks about the story of Maryam al-Salam. That when the archangel Gabriel 
he comes and gives her the message that you shall have a son. So the reply of Hazrat Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her, she says in Surah Imran chapter number 3, verse number 47, that how shall I, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? The same word, <clears throat> the same root word, Masa is there. Now, any one of us will understand when Hazrat Maryam, Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her, when she says that how shall I have a son when no man has touched me, it means sexual touch, does not mean physical touch. Because physically if someone touches a woman, she need not have a child. But sexually, if someone touches, chances are she'll have a child. So she says, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? And the reply comes, when Allah decrees a matter, Allah says, kun fayakun, be and it is. That's the full context. But the word masa here means sexual touch. Further, when we read the hadith of Prophet Muhammad <clears throat> if there's a doubt, if you can't understand certain verses of the Quran, you have to go to the next source, that is the hadith. And see to it that the hadith is authentic, is sahih. There's a hadith, a sahih hadith, of Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 17, hadith number 179. Hadat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she said. Once the Prophet kissed one of his wives and he went for prayers. He did not perform ablution. <clears throat> so Urwa, may Allah be pleased with her, she asked, Who can it be other than you? She told Hadat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. And Hadat Aisha laughed, indicating that yes, it was her. So the Sai Hadith of Abu Dawud, Volume number one in the book of Salah, chapter number 70, hadith number 179, classified as Sahih by the Muhaddisin, including Sheikh Nasruddin Albani. It says when Hazrat Men Muhammad was in the state of Wudu, he kissed his wife, Hazrat Aisha, and went for Salah without doing Wudu again. This indicates that physical touch does not break the Wudu. There are several such Sahih hadith, even if you read Sahih Bukhari. If you read the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, <coughs> volume number one, it's mentioned that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she narrates that I was between Muhammad and the Qibla when the Prophet was praying, and before he did the sujood, he pushed my leg and I moved my leg aside. Indicating that in the Salah, the Prophet touched the leg of Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, and yet continued the Salah, indicating that physical touch does not break the wudu. And there are several Sai Hadith, other Hadith, which prove to us that physical touch does not break the wudu. This Hadith is of Sai Bukhari, volume number one, Hadith number 519, 519. Now I'm asking the question, who is right? The opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa or the opinion of Imam Shafi? Imam Abu Hanifa. Because his opinion is matching with the Quran as well as the authentic Hadith. So somebody will ask me, do you mean to say that Imam Shafi was wrong? So see, we respect Imam Shafi, may Allah's mercy be on him, Rahimahullah. We respect him, we revere him, and we love him. And the Prophet said that anyone who gives opinion after doing research, any scholar gives the opinion, if the opinion is correct, he gets one reward. Sorry, if the opinion is correct, he gets two rewards. If the opinion is wrong, he gets one reward. Any scholar gives a fatwa, gives opinion. If it is correct, he gets two reward. But even if it is wrong, he gets one reward. I'm not saying that Imam Shafi, may Allah mercy be on him, that he was not intelligent. He was very intelligent. He was very knowledgeable. But we have to realize 
that during the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, may Allah mercy be on them all, all the hadith one compiled. The compilation of the hadith started before but completed later on. So maybe this hadith of Abu Dawood, volume number one, chapter number 70, hadith number 179, as well as the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number 519, it did not reach Imam Shafi. So because it did not reach him, he took one of the two options, physical touch or sexual touch, he took it as physical touch. Not that he was not intelligent, maybe this hadith didn't reach him. So based on his knowledge of the Quran, which can have one of the two meaning, he took one meaning. Not that he made a mistake purposefully, what we say, maybe this hadith didn't reach him. Let me give you another example. I asked the question that in the Salah, in the loud Salah, the Salah of Fajr, of Maghrib and Isha, after the Imam completes Surah Fatiha, according to the Hanafi Maslak, should the people in the congregation should they say Salah? Should they say Amin loudly or no? According to Abu Hanifa, according to the Hanafi Maslak, you should not say Amin loudly after the Imam completes his Surah Fatiha in the loud Salah. But according to Imam Shafi, may Allah's mercy be on him, should the people, the Muttadi, the congregation, should they say Amin loudly or no? The answer is yes. Simple. Everyone knows about it. Everyone knows about it. In the Hanafi Madhab, you don't have to say Amin loudly. In the Shafi Madhab, you have to say loudly. In the Fajr, Maghrib and the Isha Salah. Who is right? If you don't know, you have to go to Quran and the Hadith. We don't find any verse in the Quran which says that should we say Amin loudly or not. So we get to the next source. We go to the next source that is the Sai Hadith. Now, when we read the Sai Hadith, it's mentioned in Sai Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 111, Hadith number 780. Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that say Amin loudly after Surah Fatiha finished. Say Amin loudly, and if your Amin coincides with the Amin of the angels, then all your past sins will be forgiven. The next hadith, Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 112, hadith number 781, the Prophet said, If the Amin of any one of you coincides with the Amin of any one of the angels, then all your past sins will be forgiven. Sahih Bukhari. Volume number one, Book of Adan, chapter number 113, Hadith number 782, the Prophet said that after the Imam says, Gairil Magdubi alayhim wala dali, say Amin loudly. And if your Amin coincides with the Amin of the angels, all your past sins will be forgiven. I have quoted no less than three Hadith from Sahih Bukhari that you should say Amin loudly after Surah Fatiha. Similarly, there are no less than six hadith in Sai Muslim. If you read Sai Muslim, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 116, hadith number 811 to 816, there are no less than six hadith in Sai Muslim which says you should say Amin loudly. So I have given you references of at least nine Sai hadith which says that you should say Amin loudly. Now, I ask you the question. Who is correct? The Hanafi Maslak or the Shafi Maslak? The Shafi Maslak. Simple. What matches with the Quran and Sahih Hadith? You follow that. Simple. Now, come to the question. The first question, that does the Wudu break or not? When a 
person accidentally, if a man accidentally touches a woman or a woman touches a man. Imagine if a non-Muslim who accepts Islam and he asks me, Brother Zakir, if a woman touches me accidentally or if I touch a woman accidentally when I'm in wudu, am I yet in the state of wudu or not? Does my wudu break or not? So will I ask him, that is your father Hanif, you are a Shafi? See, his father was a non-Muslim. So my answer should be based on Quran and Sahih Hadith. And when we analyze the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we come to know that the wudu does not break. So irrespective whether you come from any background, unless someone comes and tells me, see brother Zakir, you know that the Hanafis have got some oil in their skin and the Shafi don't have oil, therefore the Hanafi, the wudu doesn't break and the Shafi breaks. If someone gives me some scientific reason, then maybe I'll have to think over it. But there's no such thing that the skin of the Hanafi is different and the skin of the Shafi is different. You have to go back to Allah and His Rasul. And when we do research, in the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we get the answer. Again, somebody may ask me in the second question that saying Amin loudly, Imam Shafi is correct, and Hanafi Masak not to say Amin loudly. Do you mean to say Abu Hanifa was wrong? Didn't he have knowledge? No, spiller. Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah's mercy be on him. Rahimahullah. He was a great scholar. We love him, we respect him. But not that he made a mistake purposefully. Maybe these hadith which I quoted of Sai Bukhari, poem number one, hadith number 781 to 782, and the hadith of Sai Muslim, poem number one, hadith number 811 to 816, this may not have reached him. As I have told you earlier that when the Prophet was alive, the Quran was complete, it was compiled in the supervision of the Prophet himself. He himself supervised the Quran, Alhamdulillah, was complete. And there is no difference of opinion as far as the Quran is concerned. But the Prophet did not encourage to write down the hadiths, his sayings, lest it would get mixed up. Later on, after his death, when people started saying things in the name of the Prophet, which he did not say, then the people thought, fine, now we should check up whether did the Prophet say this or not. So the compilation of the hadith started after the death of the Prophet and during the time of these great ayamas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Imam Hanbal, may Allah's mercy be on all of them, it was yet continuing, it wasn't completed. Later on, Imam Bukhari came, then Imam Muslim came, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi and then later on after the demise of the four great ayamas, the process was more formulated so therefore based on whatever was the knowledge they had they gave the opinion somebody will ask me brother Zakir do you think you're more intelligent than Abu Hanifa brother Zakir do you think you're more intelligent than Imam Shafi may Allah's mercy be on both of them I said no nothing compared to them we are nothing they were far closer to the Prophet the knowledge Mashallah. The Iman, we cannot compare. No one living now can compare to the, but we have to realize as I mentioned that the process of compilation of the Hadith was going on. So all the four Imma said, no Muslim can say that he, has, he knows all the Sahih Hadith. So because today is the age of science and technology. Now if today, at that time, during the Ayyamas, if you want to if you want to collect a hadith, you had to travel hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers, you had to write down, there was no Xerox machine. Today, Xerox is there, fax is there, email is there. From this end of the world to America, you can fax. You can send my email. Within seconds, it reaches there. That time, science and technology had not advanced. Today, if you want all the Sai Hadith, you can have on a disk. The complete Bukhari, you can have on a disk. Bukhari, Muslim, in IRF, one million hadith on one disk. Classified, say, Zaif, Maudu. So today, because of science and technology advanced, the access for us to the hadith is much more easier as compared to these great scholars. For example, today, if a 
student who passes BSc, Bachelor of Science, in terms of scientific knowledge, he may have more knowledge than Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton happens to be the best scientist of humanity. You know, Isaac Newton, number one. Michael H. Hart, when he wrote the book, The Hundred Most Influential Men in History, he places our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one. Number two, Isaac Newton. But if someone tell, comes and asks me, suppose your son has passed his BSc, or if you have passed your BSc, if someone tells, are you more intelligent than Isaac Newton? See, you may know many things which Isaac Newton did not know. But in terms of science and technology, what brain Isaac Newton had, even the Nobel Prize winner of science doesn't have. Isaac Newton had an intelligent brain. Depending upon the limited resources he had, the amount of advances he made in science is phenomenal. Therefore, he's called one of the best scientists of humankind. But today, a person who has passed BSc, overall, may have more knowledge than Isaac Newton. He knows all the laws of Newton. He even has corrected the mistake of Newton. Not he has not corrected. By the time other scientists have come, they have corrected the mistakes of Newton. So a person who has passed BSc overall may have more access to scientific knowledge than Isaac Newton. But that does not make him a greater scientist than Isaac Newton. Similarly, today when we can analyze the Hadith easily because of these great scholars, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and the other scholars right down till this age, it is easier for us to know whether the Hadith is Sahih or not and easy because of science and technology. That does not mean we are more superior to these IMAs. We are more intelligent. No, not at all. I cannot claim that and no one should claim that. Not that we are more intelligent, we are more knowledgeable. Today, because of science and technology, the knowledge is much more easily accessible. So let me clear that point very clearly. Therefore, I said the topic is sensitive. We respect all these four IMAs. They were great scholars. And the solution for the unity of the Muslim Ummah lies in the ayat I started my talk with. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, wa bi wala Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Which is the rope of Allah? The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran. Allah says, hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. Hold together strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. Be together and be not divided. Double emphasis. Double emphasis. And the Quran says in several places, Atullah wa atur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the messenger. Allah gives this commandment to the Muslims in several places in no less than 20. In more than 20 verses of the Quran, the Allah says, Atullah wa atur Rasul. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 32. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 132. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 13. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 59. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 69. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 80. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 92. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 1. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 20. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 46. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 71. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 47. In Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse number 52. In Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse number 54. In Surah Azab chapter number 33, verse number 31. In Surah, in Surah Azab chapter 33, verse number 33. In Surah Muhammad chapter number 47, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah chapter number 48, verse number 17. In Surah Hujra chapter number 49, verse number 14. In Surah Mujadila chapter number 58, verse number 13. In Surah Tagabun chapter number 64, verse number 12. In more than 20 verses of the Quran, Allah says, Atullah, what you Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. The drop of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah tells us clearly, hold together fast to the rope of Allah and be not divided to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. 
Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, Allah says that as to those who divide the religion and break it into sects, thou has nothing to do with them. Telling the Prophet, thou has nothing to do with them. Their affairs is with Allah. All their affairs is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will tell them what is the truth. Allah tells the Prophet, as to those who divide the religion and break it into sect, into sects, O Prophet, thou has nothing to do with them. All the affairs is with Allah. And Allah will tell them what is the truth. That means making sex in the religion of Islam is haram. It is prohibited. And this has been mentioned in several places in the Quran. Allah repeats this message in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 31 and 32. It says that be not like those who associate partners with Allah and like those who divide the religion and make it into mere sex and each one rejoicing that they are on the truth Allah says in Surah Room chapter 30 verse 31 and 32 that be not like those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and like those who divide the religion and make it into mere sects each one rejoicing that they are sufficient, they are on the right path. Allah repeats this message in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 53 and 54. That be not like those who divide the religion and make into sex. Each one, each one rejoicing in itself. That means they are on the truth. Allah repeats this message in Surah Shuara, chapter number 42, verse number 13 and 14. That be steadfast in religion and divide not your religion. And there are several other verses of the Quran which says, do not make sex. So making sex in the religion of Islam is haram. It is prohibited. I have given you four references. There are many other. But when we ask a Muslim, now what is he? Who is he? Some say, I'm a Hanafi. Some say, I'm a Shafi. Some say, I'm a Hamali. Some say, I'm a Malaki. Some say I'm a Salafi, some say I'm a Ali Hadith. Who was our beloved Prophet? Was he a Hanafi? Was he a Malaki? Was he a Shafi? Was he a Hanbali? Was he a Ali Hadith? Was he a Salafi? What was he? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 67, Abraham, peace be upon him, he was not a Jew or a Christian. He was true in faith. He was a Muslim. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, that the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they said that we are Muslims. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, strive in the way of Allah, O you believe, strive in the way of Allah as you ought to strive with steadfastness, with steadfastness and discipline and Allah has chosen you and has not put difficulty in your religion and he has chosen for you the cult the religion the deen of Abraham salam. and he called you Muslims in the previous revelations and in this revelation Allah says he has called you Muslims in the previous revelations and in this revelation Therefore, give charity and offer salah. So Allah says that he has named you Muslims in this revelation and the previous revelations. So Allah has given us the label of Muslim. And you find in several places of the Quran, Allah tells us that call yourself Muslims. Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim, says that I bow to the will of Allah. Ya Allah doesn't say, say I am a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Hanbali or a Mariki or a Salafi or a Ali this. Allah says, Say that I am a Muslim. Allah repeats the message. In Surah Zumur, 
chapter number 39 verse number 12 say that I'm the first to be amongst those who are Muslims who bow to the will of Allah Allah says say that you are the first amongst the Muslims and I started my talk with the master key of Dawah not started in between my talk I said the master key of Dawah is Sulan Imran chapter number 3 verse number 64 which says Kul Ya Hilal Kitab Say O oh people of the book Ta'ala wila kalmatin sawa im bainana bainakum Come to common terms as between us and you Which is the first term? Allah na uda illallah That we worship none but Allah Wala nushrika bihi shayyaw That we associate no partners with him Wala yattakhiz abad dun abad dun arbaban min dunillah That we erect not among ourselves Lords and patrons other than Allah Fa in tawallahu If then they turn back Fakulu shadu Say ye bear witness Bianna muslimoon That we are muslims Bowing up into Allah even when we speak to the non-Muslims, when there's a problem, Fakulu Shadu, eBay witness that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, that He gave us the label of Muslim. And in no less than seven verses of the Quran, He says, Call yourself Muslim, Kul, 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 say you're Muslim, say you're Muslim. Allah says in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, in Surah az zumur chapter 39, verse number 12. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 136. In Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 108. In Surah Qasas, chapter number 28, verse number 53. In Surah Ankabud, chapter number 29, verse number 46. In no less than seven places, Allah says, Kul, say that you are Muslim. Say that you are a Muslim. So where is the difference of opinion? See, all these four great aimas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ibn Ibn Hanbal, we love them all. I respect them all. I revere them all. They were great scholars. But if we read the history of these great aimas, then we will really be understanding what they said. When we read the history of Imam Shafi, I'm sorry, when we read the history of Imam Abu Hanifa, he came earlier. He was born on 701 CE, the Christian era, and died on 767 CE. In the Hijri, 150 Hijri died. He told, according to Abu Yusuf, who was one of his students, Imam Abu Hanifa said, Ya Yaqub, O Yaqub, woe to those who write down my opinions because I may say something today but leave it tomorrow I may have an opinion tomorrow I may leave it the day after Imam Abu Hanifa said oh Yaqub woe to those who write my opinions for today I may have opinion and I may leave it tomorrow tomorrow I may have an opinion and I may leave it the day after. So Abu Hanifa, may Allah's mercy be on him, Rahimahullah, he discouraged people writing his opinion. Unless it was a unanimous ijma amongst all the scholars, amongst all the students, then he gave permission. Otherwise, he did not like people writing his opinions. And according to one of his students, Zufar, he says, that Imam Shafi, he said that we should be careful. The opinion, we are human beings, we make mistakes. What opinion I have today, he said, according to the student Zufar of Imam Abu Hanifa, that I forbid people to pass opinions without proof based on my opinion. Abu Hanifa said that I forbid people to pass opinions, to make judgments without analyzing my proof. I forbid those people without analyzing my proof to pass the opinion on my statements. That means unless you don't know the proofs, you do not give opinion on my statement. He forbid those people to make without analyzing his proofs to give the opinion on the statements of Abu Hanifa. According to a student, 
Zufar. Further we read that Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, he writes, he was also an Imam, he says that Abu Hanifa said, Imam Abu Hanifa said that the Sahih Hadith is my madhab. If you find the Sahih Hadith, that is my madhab. If you find any Sahih Hadith, that is my way of life. That is my madhab. And Abu Hanifa, may Allah please with him. He said, according to Muhammad, one of his students, he said that Abu Hanifa said, Imam Abu Hanifa said, that if you find any of my fatwa, any of my opinion, which goes against the book of Allah, and the things of the messenger, you reject my opinion. That means if you find any opinion of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, which goes against Allah and his Rasul, and he say hadith which was madab, then reject his opinion. So, when people ask me, that does my wudu break if accidentally I touch a woman or not? Or, if someone asks me, that after Surah Fatiha, do you say Amin loudly or no? So I tell, that after Surah Fatiha, I say Amin loudly. If the Imam is reading in the Fajr Salah, or Maghrib Aisha, the loud Salah, after he says, Gerl Magdumi I say Amin loudly. That's the reason I am a Pakka Hanafi. Abu Hanifa said that if you find any of my opinion, any of my fatwa, which goes against the book of Allah or the messenger, reject my fatwa. So I rejected the opinion of Abu Hanifa that don't say Amin loudly, and I say Amin loudly after Surah Fatiha. That's the reason I am a Pakka Hanafi. If Hanafi means a person who follows the teachings of Abu Hanifa, then I say I am a Pakka Hanafi, 100%. The other Hanafis, they are 60%, 70%. Say Hadith was in Madam. And according to Ibn Wahab, he says that one day some people came and asked Imam Malik that while doing wudu, do we have to wipe between the web spaces of the toes? Imam Malik said, the Prophet did not do that. It's not required. After everyone went away, Ibn Abab, he told Imam Malik, and he quoted the Hadith, and he gave the narration, and gave the name of the Ravi, that the Prophet, in Wudu, he wiped his web spaces between the toes. So Imam Shafi said, yes, that is a good Hadith, that's a Sahih Hadith. And later on, whenever anyone asked Imam Malik, that should we wipe, between the web spaces, between the toes, he said yes. He changed his opinion. So whatever belongs to the Sai Hadith, his opinion was of the Sai Hadith. And Imam Malik, may Allah's mercy be on him, he said that I am a human being. I can err and sometimes I'm correct. I can err, I can make a mistake and sometimes I'm correct. But if any of my opinions go against the book of Allah and his messenger, discard my opinion. Same thing. If any of the opinions of Imam Malik, Imam Malik, may Allah be peace with him, he said, may Allah's mercy be on him, that if you find any of my fatwa, any of my opinion, which goes against Allah and Rasul, reject my opinion, discard my opinion. So the Malikis, when they offer salah, they put their hands at the side. But when we read in the Hadith of Abu Dawud, Poem number one, hadith number 755 and 757 says that you should tie your hands below the navel, but it's a zaif hadith. Both these hadith are zaif, according to Imam Abu Dawud. Abu Dawud, volume number one, hadith number 756 says that keep the hand above the navel, which is more strong than the zaif hadith. But the next hadith, Abu Dawud, volume number one, hadith number 758. Abu Dawud, volume number one, hadith number 756, says that keep the hand above the navel which is more strong than the Zayf hadith. But the next hadith, Abu Dawud, volume number one, hadith number 758, it says that when you keep your hands during salah on your chest, and it says this is the stronger hadith, though this is a Mursal hadith, Mursal means there is a link missing in between, but in the commentary it says it is the strongest than the other hadith. Even if you read the hadith of Sayyid ibn Khazaima, it says that the Prophet kept his hand on his chest when he offered salah. Even that is a mursal hadith, but along with other hadith, Sheikh Nasir al-Albani has classified it as sahih. 
So it is the strongest of all the hadith where to keep your hand. The strongest is keep on the chest. So when I offer my salah, I keep my hands on my chest. Therefore I say I am a pakka malaki. Imam Malik said, if you find any of my fatwa which goes against Allah and his Rasul, you reject my fatwa. So if the Maliki say that, Imam Malik said, keep your hands on the chest, the story is different. But assuming, he said that. But he said, if you find my fatwa which goes against Allah and his Rasul, reject my fatwa. So I rejected his fatwa. And I keep my hand on the chest. Therefore I am a pakka malaki, 100% saufi sad. The other Malikis, they are 60%, 70%. I am 100%. And if you read the history, during the Khalifa, the Caliphs of the Abbasid Caliphs, Abu Jafar and Harun Rashid, both these two Caliphs, they wanted to print the fatwa of Imam Malik, known as Muatta. The Muatta Malik. He said no. Because the companions of the Prophet, they are spread in different parts. My judgment is based on whatever limited knowledge I have. Because the companion, the Sahabas of the Prophet spread in different parts of the world, I cannot say for sure whether mine is correct or not. Therefore, he did not allow the Caliphs to make his Muatta as the law. He did not want to make his Madhab as the law of the state. Imagine, that was the thinking of Imam Malik. May Allah's mercy be on him. Next came Imam Shafi. Imam Shafi, he was a student of Imam Malik. He was also a student of the student of Abu Hanifa. And Imam Shafi said, It is not possible for any human being not to know a single hadith of the Prophet. So if you don't know some hadith, your fatwa can be wrong. So that's the reason. He said that if you find any opinion, of Imam Malik or my opinion or Imam Malik or Al-Awzari or Athauri look at where they got the opinion from means go to their source and he said do not follow my opinion blindly don't follow my opinion blindly see where they got the opinion from go back and Imam Shafi May Allah's mercy be on him. Allah. He said that if you find any say hadith, that is my madhab. So the madhab of Imam Shafi was of the say hadith. And he said if you find any say hadith which goes against my opinion, reject my opinion. He also said that if you find any of my fatwa which goes against Allah and his Rasul, reject my fatwa. So then, if people ask me, that if I'm in wudu and if accidentally I touch a woman or a woman touches me, does my wudu break? I said no. My wudu does not break because according to Sai Hadith in Abu Dawud and Sai Muslim, the wudu does not break. So therefore I am a Pakka Shafi. Because Imam Shafi said, if you find any of my fatwa, any of my opinion which goes against Allah and the opinion of the Prophet, any Sai Hadith, you reject my fatwa. So that's the reason I'm a Pakka Shafi. The other Shafi, they are 60% Shafi, 70%, 80%, not Pakka, not 100%. I am Sufi Sir Shafi. And if you know history, Imam Shafi, when he was in Baghdad, he wrote a book of his fatwas known as Al Hujja. Later on, when he traveled to Egypt and he came back, he studied under the students of Imam Light, Ibn Saad. And he changed his fatwa. Many of his fatwas he changed. He wrote a new book, Al Umm. So now we have a Qadim Shafi book, Al Hujja, and the Jajid, the new one, Al Umm. That means Imam Shafi, when he learnt and referred to Imam Light, they, people have misconception, there were only four IMRs. There were several IMRs. These four IMRs, they became popular because the students made their teachings popular. There were other Imam, like Imam Light ibn Saad. According to Imam Shafi, he said, Though Imam Shafi was a student of Imam Malik, he said that Imam Laid was far superior in fiqh than Imam Malik also. Imam Shafi can say that, we can't say that. There were several other Imams. The fourth Imam, Imam Ibn Hanbal. 
Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal also was the same opinion. He was so strict that Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, he said, don't write my opinion unless it is confirmed, unless there is an ijma. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was more strict because taklid started. He said, don't write any of my opinions. If you find any of my opinion, whether it be for Imam Malik, or my opinion on Imam Malik, or Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, go to the source. And if you find any of my opinion, which goes against the opinion of Allah and His Rasul, you reject my opinion. That's the reason I say, I am a hundred percent humbly. If humbly means a person who follows the teachings of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, I am a hundred percent humbly. Other people are seventy percent, eighty percent. So in teachings, if you say following the teachings of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah's mercy be on him, makes you Hanafi, I am a Pakka Hanafi, 100% Hanafi. If following the teachings of Imam Malik makes you a Malaki, I am a 100% Malaki. If following the teachings of Imam Shafi makes you a Shafi, I am a 100% Shafi. If following the teachings of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal makes you a Humbly, I am a 100% Saufi Sad, Humbly. Because all these four great, great Aimma said, if you find any of my fatwa which goes against Allah and His Rasul, you throw my fatwa on the wall. See, all the madhabs of all these four great Aimmas was what? What is the meaning of madhab? Madhab means way, way of going, or time of going. Another word for madhab is sunnah. Even sunnah means way. Sunnah of the Prophet means way of the Prophet. So all the madhabs of all these four Aimmas was the madhab of the Rasul. All the Aimmas said, if you find a Sahih Hadith, you reject my opinion. That means all the four Aimmas their madhab was the madhab of the Rasul. Simple. The way of the Rasul. Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him. May Allah's mercy be on him. He never came to start a new Hanafi madhab. Imam Malik never came to start a new Maliki madhab. Imam Shafi never came to start a Shafi madhab. Imam Abad ibn Hanbal never came to start a new Hanbali madhab. All of them followed the madhab of the Rasul. Like how the Christians misunderstand Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never came to teach Christianity. He came to teach Islam. Similarly, all these four great Ayamas, they came to give us knowledge of the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. Their madhab was no madhab but the madhab of the Rasul. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 4, verse number 59, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, Obey Allah and obey the messenger and those charged with affairs with those charged with affairs or with knowledge you have to follow Allah and his Rasul after that Allah says and those who are charged with the affairs those endowed with knowledge but the verse does not end there the verse continues but if they differ go back to Allah and his Rasul so if those with knowledge Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Malik Imam Hanbal May Allah's mercy be on them all. If they differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul. So all the four Ayyamas, they said the same thing. If you find my fatwa which goes against Allah and His Rasul, reject my opinion. Same thing Allah says, Atullah, Atullah, Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messengers and those charged with their faith, those and not with knowledge. But if they differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul if you believe in Allah and the last day. For this is the best and the correct way of determination. There is no better way of determination according to Allah than going back to Allah and His Rasul. It is so simple. Now, there are some brothers who come and ask me the question. Brother Zakir, fine. Those people who have knowledge of Quran and Hadith, for them it is very easy to know what is right, what is wrong, what is Sahih Hadith, what is Sahih Hadith. How can we, as lay Muslims, as common Muslims, understand what is right, what is wrong? It's a very good question. I tell them. Then they say, that's the reason we do taqlid. I tell them, see. What is the meaning of taqlid? Taqlid means, see, following the opinion of any scholar does not make you in the format of taqlid. Doesn't make you mukhalid. If, after showing proof that the scholar you are following is wrong, and then you follow him, yet that makes you a 
For example, if your mother has a heart problem, fine, has a heart problem, and some doctor, what will you do? Who will you go to? You won't go to Tom Duck and Harry, you will go to a heart specialist. You do research. MBBS? No, no, no. MD? Ha, MD. MD in what? In brain? No, no, no. Heart? Yes. So before going to a doctor, you do research. You check up what is his degree. MBBS? No, no, no. MD? Yes. MD in what? Gynecology? No, no, no. Kidney? No, no, no. Brain? No, no, no. Cardiologist? Ha, yes. DM? Super specialty. MD of medicine, then you do super specialty DM. You do your research and then you go to him. You don't blindly follow any Tom, Dick and Harry. If anyone on the street says, your mother has a heart attack, okay, do this. Will you follow him? Will you follow him? No. You will do research. Similarly, the third category, Atullah, Atul Rasul, Obey Allah and Obey the Messenger, the third category, those endowed with knowledge or those charged with their affairs, you do research. Any scholar says anything, check up whether it's right or wrong. See, everything you cannot check up. Now you have heard 10 different scholars. You understand how scholar number A, he has given about 30, 40 references and has checked up 20. 20 are, oh, Quran say Hadith. So 20 first you need not check. You check scholar number 2. Scholar number 2, mixture. Part correct. Say Hadith, part Zaif Hadith. Third scholar, majority. Pulling fast ones. Say Hadith, it's not there. Bukhari, you open Bukhari, more than 7,000 Hadith, you don't find it only. So, you have many scholars, you do little research. Now, once you are, once you make up mind, ah, scholar number one, ah, when he talks, he gives references. When I checked up the references, Quran, Say Hadith. Then, then what happens? Then when you ask an opinion, and three scholars give you the opinion, you automatically follow the first scholar because I've checked up 20 things of his it has turned out to be right even the 21st inshallah will be right so every layman cannot do research on everything everyone says so first but you have to limited research this scholar number A ah, he speaks on Quran and Hadith scholar A, B, C, D or scholar number 1 scholar number 2 or scholar number B partly right, partly wrong scholar number C or scholar number 3 majority wrong so you do little research and classify which type of a scholar is he. And then if you follow without doing research, scholar number one, no problem. But suppose you follow scholar number one, you have done research on. Another scholar comes and says, what scholar number one has said is wrong, I give you proof from Quran and Sai Hadith. You check up the proof. If it is wrong, you reject him and follow scholar number one. But if the proof that fourth scholar gave you, it is from Quran and Hadith going against the opinion of scholar number one, then you reject the fatwa of scholar number one. So if, see for example, I'm there, when I hear something, what I speak in the talk, I do my research. But there's more, more knowledge in my, in my head, in my brain, which I haven't checked up. But yet, I classify. For example, if I hear a statement from Sheikh Nasr al Albani, MashaAllah, who expired recently, according to me, is one of the greatest muhaddis of the recent times. So what he says, I follow on the face of it. Because I've checked up, he's a scholar, MashaAllah, following Quran and Sai Hadith. But if someone gets me a fatwa against Nasruddin Albani, if it's from Quran and Sunnah, I may reject the fatwa of Nasruddin Albani. I mean, but, I mean, but I know, see every human being can make mistakes. Imam Shafi made a mistake, Imam Abu Hanifa made a mistake, Imam Abu Ibn Hanbal made, Imam Malik made. So why can't Sheikh Nasrud Almani make? He can make. But he belongs to the group of scholars which checks up on Quran and Hadith. So if someone gives a fatwa, a local person from here, and Nasrud Almani, I'll believe Nasrud Almani. If I don't have time, but if I say in the lecture, I check it up. What I say in the lecture, I check up. Because I'm responsible for that. But for my own knowledge, if I have to make opinion, I can't keep on checking every hadith. Difficult. Difficult for a layman. So, but to classify which group of scholars are you reading of? Which books are you reading? Whose books are you reading? Whose cassettes are you listening to? You classify them. 
authentic scholar. This scholar makes 20% mistake. This scholar 50%. This scholar 90% mistakes. You classify and then if you don't have time and belong to the first group of scholar which is authentic, you need not check up everything. If you have the time, it is the best. Do it. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. You don't have the time, yet you can. That's not called taklid. But if someone shows you proof again, the scholar you respect, and yet you follow him blindly, that is taklid. The taklid we can only do with Allah and His Rasul. Bas. Atiullah, atiur Rasul. Bas. No one else. Simple. Simple formula. Now some people come and tell me, Brother Zakir, you talk said don't make sex. But didn't the Prophet said there will be seven three sects? I said yes. The Prophet said there will be. Prophet didn't say you should make. Allah says don't make. But Prophet knew. Even though Allah says don't make sex, the Muslims are bound to make. So he predicted there will be. He didn't say you should make. And if you read the Sahih Hadith of Abu Dawud, Hadith number 4579 and Hadith number 4580, it says that Prophet Muhammad said that the Jews were divided into 71 or 72 sects, the Christians were divided into 71 or 72 sects, and the Muslims will be divided into 73 sects. There's a hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 131, as well as hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 2643, where the Prophet said that the Bani Israel, the Jews and the Christians, they were divided into 72 sects but my ummah will be divided into 73 sects all will go to hell except one so the companions asked who are they the prophet said those that belong to me and my companions the prophet said there will be 73 sects all we go to hell except one those that belong to me and my companions and the other the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, hadith number 2652. The Prophet said, The best of the people are those of my time, means the companions, the sahabas. After that, the next generation. After that, the next generation. The Prophet said, The best people are those who are of my generation, the Sahabas. After that, the next generation, the Tabayin. After that, the next generation, Tabe Tabayin. Finish. So if you have to take anything, you have to take from the generation of the Prophet, the companions, the next generation, Tabayin and Tabe Tabayin. That's it, three generations. This we call as the salaf e -Salihin. The righteous predecessors, predecessors, or the righteous forefathers. Salaf means predecessor, forefather. So in the Sharia, in the Islamic ruling, the highest authority, there are four categories. The highest authority is the Quran, is Allah's word. If you want to find something, if it's not there in the Quran, you go to the next source that is the hadith the sai hadith the saying of the prophet in the saying of the prophet the commandment of the prophet the call carries more weight than the actions of the prophet so if the commandment and the actions contradict the commandment carries weight the third source is the sahabas ijma the three generations Sabas, Tain and Tabitain. The Ijma of these people, of the Saba, carries more weight than the individual opinion of the Saba. Then, Tain, Tabitain. And the last source is the Qiyas. If you don't find in any top three sources, in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the lifestyle of the Saba, the Tain and Tabitain, then you can use Qiyas. Analogy. Deduction. So, Sharia, on four things broadly the Quran the Hadith no Sai Hadith will contradict the Quran Quran number one then comes Sai Hadith in the Sai Hadith call carries more weight than the Amal the commandment carries more weight than the action then the lifestyle of the three generations Sabas 
Tain tabe tain. Ijma is more than individual opinion. Then comes the kiyas. So this is how we should follow. We should follow Quran and the Sunnah. But now all the groups say we follow Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah. Everyone, no one says he does not follow Quran and Sunnah. So how should the Quran and Sunnah be followed? The way the Prophet and the Sahaba understood. The way the three generations, the Sahaba said, Allah the Rasul said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best generation is my generation. Then the next, then the next. So if there is difference of opinion in how to understand a verse of the Quran, we have to see how did the Sahabas understand it. If you don't find in that, then the next generation, Tabayin. If you don't find in that, then the next generation, Tabay Tabayin. This is how you follow. Because many verses of the Quran, for example, the word Masah has got two meanings. Sexual touch, physical touch. When you go to the Hadith, you come to know it is sexual touch, not physical touch. Easy. Similarly, when there is any difference of opinion in understanding any verse of the Quran, you have to understand according if there are any other verses, commentary of the Quran, Quran is the best. If not, go to the Sahih Hadith of the Prophet. If you don't find there, in the lifestyle of the Sahabas, the Tabayin, the Tabi Tabayin, finish. So for proof, for Hujja in understanding the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, we have to follow it according to Allah, His Rasul, and the Salafi Salihin. This is how we look at it. Otherwise, many verses of the Quran can mean two things. Like there's a verse in the Quran in Surah Baqarah that those who are martyrs, they are not dead, they are alive. Some people say, oh, that means they are alive. That means you can talk to them. If the martyrs are alive, the shahid are alive, even the prophet is alive. Very good logic. But how did the Saba understood? Did the Saba consider the prophet to be alive? They buried him. They even read the Janadeh Ka Salah. Even the martyrs, when they were killed in the battlefield, didn't the Sahabas read the Janadeh Ka Salah? Can you read Janadeh Ka Salah of a live person? No. So what the Quranic verse says, that when the enemies rejoice that we killed your people, they are alive within the year after, they are in benefit. It does not mean physically they are alive. If physically they are alive, why did the Sahabas bury them? So here if you understand the Quranic verse, difficulty, two opinions, go to the Quran, the Sunnah, the way of the Sahabas and the Salaf is solving. And you get the reply. No difficulty. Easy. Don't have to be a scholar. Little bit jihad, little bit research. Little bit, not much. Now, there is another group of people. When I ask them, that who are you? What are you? They say, I'm an al Hadith. So I say, what is the meaning of al Hadith? He said, we are the people of the Quran and the Sunnah, Quran and the Hadith. So I said, fine. Makes sense. So I tell them, okay, fine. If you want to say al Hadith, I would prefer calling myself al Sai Hadith. Because I only follow Quran and Sai Hadith. There are other Muslims who even follow Zaif Hadith and Maudu Hadith. I am an al Sai Hadith. If you want to call me something. See, LA Hadith means see, other people, they follow Zaif Hadith, Modu Hadith, keeping hand below navel, no problem. So, they call themselves LA Hadith. No, I'm LA Sai Hadith. If you want to call. So I ask these people, that brother, you call yourself LA Hadith, means we are Pakka, following Quran and Sunnah. I said, very good. So I asked them the question, that which verse of the Quran, in which verse of the Quran did Allah say, call yourself al Hadith? They say, we don't find any. Is there any Sai Hadith in which the Prophet said, call yourself al Hadith? No reply. So therefore, I don't call myself al Hadith, I call myself Muslims, therefore I'm a Pakka al Hadith. You all are? Kacha. 90%, 95%. Maybe 98 percent. I'm pakka ahle hadith. Ahle sahi hadith. It makes sense or not? When you say you follow Quran and sahi hadith, there is no Quranic verse in which Allah says call yourself ahle hadith. There is no sahi hadith in which the prophets said call yourself ahle hadith. There is another 
group of people similar to El Hadith. They say we are Salafi. So I say, Salafi? They say, I'm a Salafi. So I said, what's the Salafi? So he said, Salafi means following the Salafi Salim. I said, even I follow Salafi Salim. I follow Allah, His Rasul, and the Salafi Salim, the generation at the time of the Prophet, the next generation, and the next generation. But then I asked him, that did any time, is there any verse in the Quran which Allah says, call it, says Salafi? They said, no. Is there any hadith in which Allah's Prophet said, call us a Salafi and they said no but there was one Salafi who came and gave me a hadith the Prophet said I am a Salaf and he quoted Sahib Sahib Muslim didn't give me the reference I said fine I went to Sahib Muslim let's check there was a hadith Sahib Muslim reference is 2405 something or like that 2400 something Hadith, Sai Hadith. But the, it was a picked up Hadith in between. The complete Hadith says that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her daughter, that I am an excellent Salaf for you. I am an excellent Salaf for you. The father telling his daughter. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his daughter, Hazrat Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her. I am an excellent Salaf. As I told you, Salaf literally in Arabic means predecessor, forefather. So if I tell my daughter, I am your Salaf, no problem. An Arab who's a Christian, if he tells in Arabic to his daughter, I am your Salaf, no problem. So literally no problem. But Islamically, Islamically predecessor, fine, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was an excellent son of his daughter but here every father may not be an excellent Islamic person for his daughter maybe the daughter or the children may be more Islamic than the father so every father can can't tell the children no literally if you understand the word Salaf according to scholars who the Salafis claim to be good scholars they say that literally no one today can say he's a Salaf why? We are Khalaf. We came afterwards. The Salafs are before us. So compared to the previous people, we are Khalaf. Yes, we can be Salaf of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So technically we can be Salaf. Islamically we can't. Islamically, we are Khalaf. Clear? Fine. When I had gone to Australia, the first time I went to Australia, I had gone for lecture tour, and a group of good brothers, mashallah, following Quran and Sunnah, Sai Hadith, they called me for a lecture tour. And normally we had correspondence, we came. And we reached in that city. I, won't, I don't name the group, they're good brothers, mashallah. We reached in the night. So I and my camera crew were with me. So we offered salah. We offered the salah. So they said, hey man, you pray like us. I said, what do you mean I pray like you? I pray like the Prophet. He said, hey man, you pray like us. He said, what do you mean I pray like you? I pray like the Prophet. See, this, this group, mashallah, they are following Quran and Sai Hadith. But what they should have said, we are proud that you pray like the Prophet. They said, you pray like me. I never saw him praying before. I'm praying from yours. So I'm not praying like him. I'm praying like the Prophet. And Alhamdulillah, he's also praying like the Prophet. So what he should have said is, we are proud that you pray like the Prophet. But he said, hey man, you pray like us. Very happy. Because when they called me, they had seen my cassettes, but they did not know. They saw what? They had seen my cassettes, but they did not know. They saw what? Zakir's piece of comparative religion is correct. But we don't know Zakhida. We don't know Zakhida. So, reluctantly they called me, seeing that, fine, I'm a specialist in the field of comparative religion. They saw my cassettes, they didn't find anything wrong. But they didn't know my Akhida. They, they didn't know how I pray. So they called me reluctantly. But when they saw me praying, they were happy. Ah. Hey man, you pray like us. So I said, no, I pray like the Prophet. But they were good brothers, mashallah. So then I gave the same, you know. Then we sat for dinner and we had a good talk. And the same topic I said, I'm a Pakta Hanafi, I'm a Pakta Shafi, Pakta Hamli, Pakta Eliyadis. So when it came to Salafi, I said, I'm a Pakta Salafi. 
but nowhere does the Quran say call us a Salafi. Oh, there's no Sahih Hadith in which the Prophet said call us a Salafi. So most of the brothers, they agreed with me, except for one. One brother, he disagreed. All the other brothers, MashaAllah, Zakir, bye. Brother Zakir, we agree with you. One brother, he said, he asked me, Brother Zakir, do you know Sheikh Nasir al -Bani? I said, yes, I know him. What do you think of him? I said, MashaAllah. One of the greatest Mahathis of our time, that was a few years back, when Sheikh Nasruddin was alive. Rahimullah. May Allah's mercy be on him. Ha, you agree with me? He's a good scholar. I respect him. I love him. I revere him. Okay. I will give you his statement. So he went on the internet and he downloaded from albani.com his fatwas. Now reply to these fatwas. And Sheikh Nasir Albani, may Allah's mercy be on him. I love him. I respect him. I revere him. I appreciate him, mashallah. And he is of one of the two groups of scholars. One group of scholars saying, saying Salafi is fard. And he belongs to that group of scholars, one of the staunches, saying Salafi is fard. So I, I said, Alhamdulillah, if anyone, the day anyone proves me from Quran and Sai Hadith, if today someone proves me, I will accept it today itself. But I will check it up. Huh? If anyone proves to the day anyone proves to me, from the Quran and the Sai Hadith that calling yourself Salafi is a fard, or calling yourself Ahliyad is a fard, I will call. Or calling yourself Hanafi is a fard, or Maliki is a fard, I will tell that. In action I am, in label, I prefer calling myself Muslim. So when I went to his fatwas, Sheikh Nasir Dalbani, he gave fatwas of great scholars, and he said that Abu Hanifa said, and the Hadith he quoted that there will be 73 sects, all will go to hell, except one, that is the Jamaah. And if you cross-reference, Jamaah means the first three generations. Cross-reference, Sai Bukhari. Yes, I, I agree with that. He quoted Abu Hanifa said, Imam Abu Hanifa said, that the Jamaah means following the way of the companions, the next generation, next generation, the self is following. I said, I do that. He gave the quotation of Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. It is obligatory that you follow the self is following. I said, I do that. He gave the fatwa of Imam Shafi. It is compulsory you follow the three generations, the pious three decessors. I said, I follow, what's the problem? But did these people say, call yourself Salafi? Abu Hanifa never said that. Imam Shafi never said that. Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah never said that. People assume he said, he never said that. So now, there is no proof from Quran and Sai Hadith that you should call yourself Salafi. There is a khiyas, a logic of Sheikh Nasr al -Mani. and I appreciate Sheikh Nasr al -Mani. he's a very good scholar. Inshallah, within a few minutes I will end. There's a question answer session. How I had a question answer session? If you go to Nasr al you'll find there. He tries to convince with logic why you should call yourself a Salafi. He says, questioner and Sheikh replying. Sheikh asks, what are you? The questioner says, I'm a Muslim. So Sheikh Nasr al -Mani replies, what type of Muslim are you? Are you a Khariji? Are you a Mutazali? Are you a Shiai? Are you a Rifadi? Are you a Qadari? What type of Muslim are you? So the questioner says, I am a Muslim following Quran and Sunnah. What Sunnah? Everyone says Quran and Sunnah. The, khawari, the Khariji says Quran and Sunnah. The Shia says Quran and Sunnah. The Qadr is a Quran Sunnah. What type of Quran Sunnah are you? So he says, I follow Quran and Sunnah like the way the Salaf is Salihin understood. The Sheikh says, yes, very good. You have to follow Quran and Sunnah the way the Salaf is Salihin understood. So for this big sentence, in short form, the word is Salafi. And the debate was won according to the Salafi. The debate was won. And on the internet you go, I respect Sheikh Nasr al -Mani. Many of my talks, when I want to check up a hadith, I see him. So I respect him, mashallah. I love him, I revere him, but no taqlid. No taqlid. Taqlid only belongs to Allah and his Rasul. Fine, see, this is logic, this is kiyas. See, logic, I say, prove to me from Quran and Sunnah, not logic. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Allah has blessed me with logic. Summa alhamdulillah. I am not a scholar. 
I consider myself a student of talib ilm, a student of knowledge. But Allah has blessed me that I've met many scholars, whether it be of the great Indian scholars, whether from Nadwa, whether from Deoban, whether it be the Saudi scholars, Alhamdulillah, whether it be the scholars from other parts of the world, Allah has blessed me. I had the opportunity to interact with the great scholars of the present time. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Interacting with them, Allah has increased my knowledge, but yet I am a student. I'm very small. I have limited knowledge. But the logic is there, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with logic. So based on that, what type of Muslim are you? Are you a Khariji? Are you a Mutazali? Are you a Shia? Are you a Qadri? Are you a Sufi? Based on that, he won the debate. So he said, see, then Sheikh replies, no, but the questioner says, but didn't Allah say, call yourself Muslim? So the Sheikh replied that that time there was only one Islam. Now there are different groups. So therefore it is compulsory, fard, obligatory, you should identify yourself as a Salafi. Logic. Now comes my reply. And the debate was ended there. Sheikh Nasud al-Bani won the debate. See, for me, don't debate with me. Prove to me from Quran and Sunnah, immediately Dr. Zakir Naik will accept. Debating, Alhamdulillah, Summa, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me. In debating, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me. My response to Sheikh Nasrud al -Bani. I respect him, I am nothing compared to him. I am not even a drop in the ocean compared to Sheikh Nasrud al -Bani. So please don't get me wrong. Many of my talks are based on his research, mashallah. So please don't get me wrong. I love him, I respect him, but no taklid. I tell him, fine, if you see the lifestyle in the history of the Prophet, he didn't quote any hadith to me. He didn't quote to me any verse of the Quran that called us as Salafi. So I don't call. No logic. At the time of the Prophet, they were hypocrites, munafiks. Fine? They were munafiks. The Sahabas did not change the name. They were Kharijis, Khawarij, Kharijites. They called themselves Kharaji. People gave them the label. The Sahabas yet called themselves Muslims. Did the Sahaba say, give them a new name? No. They continued calling themselves Muslim. They were Mutazalites. People yet continued calling themselves Muslims. So at that time also there were differences. Not that they were not. Now coming to the question. That therefore Sheikh Nasir al-Bani says you should call, you, call yourself Salafi. My question is, which Salafi? Which Salafi? My counter question. And now do you know how many of Salafi? Are you a Qutubi? Or Sururi? Or Matkhali? I can name another Salafi. See, I'm not speaking against anyone. Please don't get me wrong. I don't mean ill to any of them. But even in Salafi, there are various groups. And if you go to UK, Masha Allah, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. There are so many groups in UK, each group fighting against the other, calling the other Salafi a kafir. Nausbillah. We'll come to that later on if time permits. So which Salafi do you belong to? Again, see whatever label you give, there's bound to be tafarraqa. When the Shias came, people said we are Sunni. Again there was group, Ahle Sunnah wal Jamaat. Then, Again there was division, Hanafi, Shafi, Hamli, Malaki, then we came with Salafi, Ali Hadith. There's group even in this. The moment the name, the name given by human beings, there's bound to be tafarraku. Even in Allah's name, Muslim, there's bound to be division. Allah told that. But don't think the name you give will not have division. Don't you think Allah did not know? Allah knew there are going to be division in the Muslim Ummah. He told in the Quran, the Prophet predicted, yet the Prophet didn't say, call yourself Ali Hadith. Call yourself Salafi. Ali Hadith. Which Ali Hadith in, in Bombay where I come from? There are two Ali Hadith. Jamiyat Ali Hadith and Gurba Ali Hadith. So which Ali Hadith do I belong to now? One Ali Hadith blaming the other Ali Hadith. See, I don't want to mean any harm to the Ali Hadith. Therefore I said the topic is sensitive. Wallah, I'm only trying to talk about Quran and Allah's Rasul. Please don't feel bad. I respect Nasruddin al-Mashaykh Nasruddin al-Mani. I respect the Salafis. I look amongst all these groups that are there. We have to agree. 
the Ahle Hadith and the Salafis are the closest to the Quran and Sunnah. I'm proud to say that. But, but, which Salafis? So maybe during the early times of Sheikh Nasir al-Mani, there weren't groups in the Salafi, now there are groups. Sururi, Madkhali, Putubi. Oh, he's not right, he's not right, he's calling him Salafi. But he's, so now we have new books, true Salafi, true Salafi. I read a book called Salafi Dawa, true Salafi, true Salafi. What is this true Salafi? I say, you know we had a Dawa training program in Bombay, where we invited people from different parts of the world. There were 14 people, there were 19 people from 14 different countries. And many of them were from Medina University, mashallah, from Bahrain University, all more than 50% were Salafi, mashallah. So we had a discussion there. So then I asked the question. Salafi shortcut, short name. Instead of saying, I believe in Quran and Hadith according to the way of Salafi Salih, shortcut Salafi. So I asked him, the Salafi Salihin is better or Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is superior? Who's better? So they told me, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So why not call yourself Muhammadi? Right or wrong? In India, who calls themselves Muhammadi? You know? Do you know? Do we agree with them? No. Who calls themselves Muhammad in India? Who is superior? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah. Allah. So one who submits evil to Allah is called a Muslim. We know there are divisions in Muslim, but whatever name you give, there are going to be division. In the Hanafi Masjid, there were four students. In Shafi Masjid, there's Qadim and Jadid. In the Ahle Hadid, I went to Kashmir, there are many groups of Ahle Hadid. I went to Kerala, Mujahideen. Mujahideen. KNM, Kerala Nazratul Mujahideen. There, people don't call themselves Ahle Hadith. Mujahideen. If you go to Saudi Arabia and say, I'm Ahle Hadith, what is this new Ahle Hadith? Very few people of the Saudis know who's an Ali Hadith. For them, they know Salafi. But Salafi and Ali Hadith belong to the same group, the names are different. In some country, Ansari. Why? So, when he's saying call herself Salafi, that means the Ali Hadith of India, they aren't Salafis. Fine. So here we realize that if you want to give a label, Instead of Salafi, Muhammad is better. Instead of Muhammad is Muslim. Therefore, I say, Atullah, Atullah. Therefore, I, for label, I prefer calling myself Muslim. That's it. First a Muslim, last a Muslim. I am not hurting any of my Muslim brothers, whether it's a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Hanbali or a Maliki or a Ahli Hadith or a Salafi. Believe me, I love all. I love all my Muslim brothers. I am not here to hurt anyone's feeling. Therefore I said, Ta'ala will have come within Sava in Bainana Bainakum. Come to come in terms as with us and you. I am coming to come in terms. I respect Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi. I respect the great scholars of this. I respect the Salafi Salin. I follow them. Alhamdulillah. Therefore first the Muslim, last the Muslim. Now, one of the second reasons for the disunity is which organization you belong to. Organization. Ah, I belong to Jamaat Islami. I belong to Tablik Jamaat. Ikhwani. So these organizations, what happens? These ah, see if you follow Quran and Sunnah, but if you don't belong to my organization, I'm not with you. See, making organization is not wrong in Islam. Giving name to an organization, Jamaat Islami, Jamyut Ali Hadith, no problem. Giving any name, Jamyut Ali Giving name to an organization, Jamaat Islami, Jamyut Ali Hadith, no problem. Giving any name, Jamyut Ali Hadith, Jamaat Islami, or center named after Sheikh Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, any no problem, but. If that organization is following Quran and Sunnah, according to Salaf and Salih, it's the right organization, otherwise it is wrong. Give it any name. After Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. After Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. After Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him. After Abu Hanifa, may Allah's mercy be on him. No problem. No problem. If that organization is following Quran and Sahih Hadith, as understood by the Salaf and Salihin, 
it's the right organization. If it is not, reject the organization, whether its name is belonging to anyone, whether it's after Ibn Taymiyyah or whether it is Salafi, whether it's Ahli Hadith, if it follow Quran and say Hadith according to the understanding of the Salafi Salihin, it is the right organization. So forming organization is not wrong in Islam. Because like we are specialized in Dawah. Some people are specialized in Islam. Some people are specialized in science. No problem. But what happens if there are two organizations doing Dawah? Two organizations. Both are following Quran and Sunnah. But it does not belong to my organization, so I'm against him. I start giving fatwa. What fatwa? That person is a kafir. Takfir. Direct. Don't go to that organization. You know, people said, don't come to the peace exhibition. You know? But the Zakir told me, people are telling, don't come to peace exhibition. Why? Because peace exhibition is not organized by me. If it was organized by me, then it is good. If it is organized by the Jamaat I belong to, it is a good exhibition. If it is not organized by my Jamaat, it's not a good organized. It's not a good exhibition. Why? We have to see Allah and His Rasul. If that organization, if that exhibition is following Quran and Sahih Hadith, according to the understanding of the Salaf Salih, it is the right organization. There's no problem. So making organization is no problem. As long as the organization is on the Quran and Sahih Hadith. So if you want to join any organization, verify for yourself whether the organization, the Quran and Sahih Hadith, if there's a difference in the Hadith and Quran understanding, as per the understanding of the Salaf Salih, the pious predecessors, the three generations, finished. And says easy. But people give fatwa. Takfir. We'll come to takfir later on. And according to according to the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, one number eight, hadith number 637, the Prophet said, any Muslim who says kafir to another Muslim, it comes back to him. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, one number eight, hadith number 6103, that anyone, any Muslim, tells to another Muslim, he's a kafir, he kills him. Now based on this, the scholars, they said, great scholars, they said that you should not do takfir. Takfir means calling another Muslim, another believer a kafir. And there are various fatwas of these hadith that according to Hafiz ibn Hajar, he said that what the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari says that if you call a Muslim a kafir, it comes back to you. That means the kufr comes back to you and you become a kafir. Sheikh Shaukhani, he said that do not call another believer a kafir until the proofs, the burhan are as clear as the daytime of the sun. Unless it's clear to you that he's a pakka kafir. Proof. See if you, it's not fard to call a kafir a kafir. It's not fard. Even if the Muslim may be a kafir, why are you giving a fatwa? Takfir. One man calling another kafir outside the fold. So the various fatwas describing it is wrong. Now as I mentioned, as far as calling the word Salafi, there are two groups of scholars. One group of scholars said it is fard. And I give you an example of Sheikh Nasr al Albani. I want to even let you know that Sheikh Saleh Fawzan, who I respect, he is the scholar of the present time, even he says calling Salafi is a fard. To a lesser extent, not very staunch, is Sheikh Bin Baz. He says, fine, to identify yourself, no problem. But there are other group of scholars who say calling Salafi is wrong. Scholars who believe in Quran, Hadith, and Salafi Salihin. First, I will quote you the person who's respected the most amongst the Salafis of the present time, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. There's a book called The Call to Islam and the Caller, in which 40 hadiths are mentioned. The 40th hadith, the last hadith, is a hadith in which it is mentioned. It's hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 2600. There it is said that Allah's Messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I have been instructed with five things which I am instructing to you. First is Jama'ah. First is Jama'ah. Jama'ah means 
following the three generation the self is solving second is obeying third is hearing fourth is hijra and fifth is jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first is jama following self is solving second is hearing third is obeying fourth is hijra fifth is jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five things and anyone who goes away by a span difference from the jama he has thrown the yoke of islam off his neck and anyone who calls to anyone besides allah he is inviting you to the abode of hellfire hadith classified as sahih sheikh ibn taymiyyah says after this hadith in this book that one of the salaf the pious predecessor he said that i don't know on which of the two things should i thank allah more for bringing me to islam or for keeping me away from the innovators one of the salaf he quotes and he says i don't know which of the two things should i thank allah more for bringing me islam for me becoming a muslim or for keeping me away from the innovators you should call yourself only even in the previous hadith of tirmidhi it ends by saying if you call anything besides the way of the allah what allah has called you and he says muslim mu'min and abdullah a muslim a believer and the worship of allah if you call anything besides the three things to yourself you are calling yourself to hellfire hadith this salaf sheikh ibn taymiyyah quotes that if you call anything i don't know which thing should i thank more for allah for bringing me islam or for keeping me away from the innovators you cannot call anything besides what allah has called you in the quran muslim mu'min and abdullah sheikh ibn taymiyyah so how can you quote saying sheikh ibn taymiyyah says you should call us a salafi what sheikh ibn taymiyyah says you have to follow the salafi salah in which even i say sheikh ibn taymiyyah never said call us a salafi I'm quoting you another scholar, Sheikh Otaimi. Now, see, all these scholars are stalwarts of the present time. All three expired now: Sheikh Nasrul Darbani, Sheikh Bin Baz, Sheikh Otaimi. In the book of "Until When Will We Differ," there's a book of Sheikh Nas of Sheikh Otaimi. It's available there in the exhibition. "Until When Will We Differ?" on page number thirty-six. An Indian asks Sheikh Otaimi a question. In my country, people call towards Ikhwani and Tablighi. Are they on truth or falsehood? Sheikh Utaimi gives the reply. If anyone calls himself a Dekhwani, calling towards Dekhwani, Tablighi or Salafi, he is on falsehood. The question of Salafi wasn't there. Sheikh Utaimi goes out of his way to say that anyone calls himself a Dekhwani, a Tablighi or a Salafi, calling towards him, it is on falsehood, not I. See, Doctor Zakir Naik is nothing in Islam. I am zero. Sheikh Utaimi, Mashallah, has a caliber. So I am following the fatwa of Sheikh Utaimi. So any Salafi who points a finger at me will have to point a finger at Sheikh Utaimi. Now all these people on the website you go, they even say Sheikh Utaimi says call us a Salafi. What he says? Sheikh Utaimi says you should follow the Salafi solely. But that even I say. So Sheikh Utaimi does not mind anyone following Salafi Salwain, but if you call towards saying call yourself a Salafi, he says it is falsehood. Sheikh Utaimi. So Sheikh Nasrun Albani is on one extreme. Fard, Sheikh Utaimi says it is wrong. But both agree. Sheikh Nasrun Albani also says that if you call yourself Salafi, thinking you're superior, then it is wrong. Sheikh Saleh Fawzan also says if you say I'm a Salafi, I'm superior, then it is wrong. So even these first group of scholars who say calling Salafi is a fard, even they agree. If you call yourself Salafi and say that I am superior, I will go to Jannah. Others won't go. That is wrong. Sheikh Saleh Fawzan, Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, Sheikh Bin Baz, Sheikh Utaimi. Besides saying this, he says you should not call yourself a Salafi. I am not as staunch as Sheikh Utaimi. If you ask me, I said preferably call yourself Muslim. If someone calls him say Salafi, in some cases can be mubah. Fine, shortcut. I don't say it's haram. I don't say it's haram. But I prefer safe, hundred percent safe Muslim. The scholars are differing. Should call or not call? 
if someone is calling as a shortcut instead of saying I follow Quran, Hadith and Salafi Salafi only to that extent which is not the case most of the people they say Salafi safe sect and all the others go to Jahannam so this way it is wrong for short reason if you say I say Mubah not a farad I move with the fatwa of Sheikh Salim Munajjid Sheikh Salim Munajjid said if you call for understanding that you do not belong to the innovators there is no problem but if someone calls saying I'm a Salafi better then it is wrong and he quoted the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Madinah there was a fight between the Ansar and the Muhajids so the Ansar said oh Ansar come to me so all the Ansars piled behind Ansar and the Muhajir said oh Muhajir come help me the Prophet came to know he said what is this call of Jahiliya see if you analyze calling Ansar is not bad calling Muhajir is not bad but here they were making groups Ansar come and help me Muhajir come and help me the Prophet said it is the call of the Jahiliya though Ansar is a good name Ansar means the helpers helpers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhajir means those who migrated in the way of Allah and His Rasul it's a good name but yet the Prophet said it is haram to identify yourself I'm superior so based on this I don't say Salafi is haram don't get me wrong but absolutely safe is Muslim if you say Salafi and have a little bit of error and you know ego and all problem may go to the may be dangerous with the Prophet prohibited therefore safe is call in any minimum Muslim and say that I'm a Muslim otherwise I can say I'm a Pakka Hanafi, Pakka Shafi, Pakka Hamli, Pakka Malki, Pakka Salfi, Pakka Elia, this is no problem. But in label, call yourself a Muslim. I would like to end my talk by giving the opinions in the ending of these great scholars, which will open up your mind. According to those people who say Takfir, Takfir, Kafir, Kafir, Imam Shafi, may Allah's mercy be on him, he said that if calling the names, the attributes of Allah, what Allah has given is that. Anything else is haram, is kufr. You can only call to the name of Allah what he and his messenger have given, nothing else. Anything else is kufr. But if someone calls another name in ignorance, then he's not a kafir, Imam Shafi. Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, you know what he said? He said, <coughs> if someone prostrates to a man and he thinks this is his deen then he's not an unbeliever Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah if someone does shudu to a man Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah said if someone does sajda to a man to a human being and thinks it is his deen he is not an unbeliever until someone explains to him and yet he's on it Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah what a great personality Further, if you read Sheikh Shaukani, he said that if someone bows down to anyone besides Allah in ignorance, he is not an unbeliever. Muhammad ibn Wahab, may Allah's mercy be on him, he said that we do not call unbelievers to those people who bow on the idol of the grave of Abdul Qadir. Or on the idol of the grave of Ahmad Badawi, or the likes of it. So, how can we call an unbeliever to those people who do not do shirk? We claim that we are knowledgeable, giving takfir, kafir, kafir, etc. I would like to end with the two. Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, what a great personality. Further, if you read Sheikh Shaukani, he said, that if someone bows down to anyone besides Allah in ignorance he is not an unbeliever Muhammad ibn Wahab may Allah's mercy be on him he said that we do not call unbelievers to those people who bow on the idol of the grave of Abdul Qadir or on the idol of the grave of Ahmad Baddawi or the likes of it so how can we call unbeliever to those people who do not do shirk we claim 
that we are knowledgeable giving takfir kafir kafir etc i would like to end with the two hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in sahih muslim volume number 3 hadith number 4565 that arfa ja may allah be pleased with him he said that the messenger of allah said that there will be a time when evil things will happen in a community and whenever a person disrupts the unity of the muslim umma strike him with the sword and if he does not stop kill him a messenger said anyone who tries to disrupt the unity of the muslim umma strike him with the sword if he does not stop kill him sahi muslim volume number 3 Hadith number four thousand five hundred and sixty-five. I would like to end my talk with the last hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is from Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number three thousand six hundred and six. I know the lecture is long. Last hadith. Yar, Hudayfa ibn Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him. He says that people like asking to the Prophet what things are good, but I. Due to fear, like to ask the Prophet what is evil, and he asked the Prophet that we were in ignorance and evil, and Allah through His guidance, He brought us to the good. Will there be any evil after this? The Prophet said, "Yes, there will be evil." Will there be any good after that evil? The Prophet said, "Yes, but with a little zakhan, with a little evil." So the Sahaba asked, "What is that evil?" The Prophet said, "There will be some people who will call towards things which are not my tradition." The Sahaba asked, "After that, will there be an evil?" The Prophet said, "Yes. There will be people who will call you to the hellfire." So Hudayfa, may Allah be pleased with him, he asked, "What should we do?" So the Prophet replies. Hold fast to the group of Muslims and the chief. So the Sahaba asked, "What if there is no group of Muslim and the chief?" The reply of the Prophet is, "If there are no group of Muslim or no chief, dissociate yourself from all the sects, even if you have to bite the root of the tree until you meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in that state." Wa akhir dawana alhamdulillahirabbilalamin.